Uh, Bohan Bozik is our presenter uh, this month talking about uh, a gem for your data, data analysis intro into Ruby. Uh, Bohan, why don't you take it away? Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, let me just pull up the presentation in a second. Not to feel the thunder, but I just wanted to tell Bailey congratulations. I think that's cool, man. Thanks, no problem. I shall keep the Ruby jokes to a minimum, even though I do like Ruby. <laughs> okay, so I uh, hope, hope everyone's able to see that. I see a gem for your data. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so yeah, my name is Boyan. Actually, um, I'm a lecturer at Technological University in Dublin, Ireland. Um, and today I'd like to introduce uh, to you some of the gems that Ruby offers uh, for data analysis. So usually when people hear data, they think Python, as you said yourself uh, earlier. Uh, but, but I think those who appreciate the elegance of Ruby, um, there are al alternatives as well. Um, and yeah, so I'm, I'm not actually saying that you absolutely have to use Ruby for data science. I think, uh, very little people would would actually uh, come up with that idea, and I'm also not saying that that it's in any way superior to Python because I don't think it is. Uh, but it is actually a small wonder because you know um, if you think about the efforts to go into making Python the language for data, uh, it's kind of you know natural that that most people start with Python when when they are doing any type of data analytics or data science. But what I am saying is that if you're a Ruby coder, then uh, that doesn't mean that you have to run to Python for, for every task in data wrangling uh, or, or every you know, data science problem uh, that you might encounter. Uh, so, so, you know, because there's actually a lot, of, a lot of things in Ruby that can be sold without any downside. Um, sometimes I would even say quicker or cleaner, but who, I, who am I to judge? So take a look for yourself. Um, so today, actually, what I would like to do is give you a bit of an intro into some of the libraries um, that that Ruby uses. So it's going to be very basic, still. Um, I'm not going to dive too deep into the into the matter, but um, but you know, afterwards, very happy to connect if if you have any further interests or would like to to know more uh, about any of the topics I'm going to scratch on. Um, but yeah, so if you take away one thing from this talk, it's it should be the libraries, right? So so there are a few things that can be used in Ruby very nicely and very efficiently uh, to to help you with a lot of the uh, data analytics stuff that you might encounter in your daily work, especially. Um, yeah, so I'm just gonna yeah show you a bit of uh, things that that might be worth exploring. Uh, most of it is going to be code, actually, um, and yeah. So just 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 going to be a bit of showcasing into the the things that can be done easily with Ruby. Um, yeah. So as for the agenda, as you can see here, uh, hopefully there's going to be a bit about libraries like basics, uh, filtering, sorting, and grouping in Ruby. So all the stuff that you do with uh, CSV CSV files. Uh, after you load them up in, uh, so usually you would use data frames. So it's also going to be a bit of combining of them, reading and writing data to files and plotting. So that's more or less the major things uh, that I'd like to discuss today. So yeah, let's start with the libraries, as I said. Uh, for me personally, uh, I work a lot with students um, and we always start with the very basics. Um, so. Uh, sorry, I think you lost me for a second. I hear you. I can hear it to you. It's just, it's just sad that uh, lost connection. Okay, anyway, so uh, so as I said, the libraries are the uh, most important part, and as I do with students a lot, is kind of uh, exploring the very basics and showing them how efficient uh, like the first data analytics can be 
So this is actually what, what takes you quite far already into uh, yeah, looking into, into data of any kind. So the first one I'd like to introduce is Numo, which is kind of the, uh, the Ruby version of NumPy. And as you will see, it's, it's very compatible with NumPy as well. So you can, um, on any problems that you work on with uh, Numo can be easily uh, just saved into a file that can be read into NumPy again. Um, so it, it works uh, back and forth uh, quite efficiently. Uh, the, the gist of it is basically taking uh, on large multidimensional arrays, uh, which are mostly used. So it, it's kind of linear algebra mostly that you'd need for especially deep learning, but also kind of the basics of uh, machine learning um, to kind of prepare the data for it. Uh, then we have the Roo. So the Roo is uh, very much like Pandas in Python, uh, which means it works on, on data frames. So if you load up a CSV file, for example, you can, it's kind of organized like a, like a table from a database and you can do all kinds of operations and manipulations on it. Uh, to kind of showcase what, what insights your data provides. Um, then the, the maybe a, a bit more interesting one is uh, the so-called Rumale library, uh, which stands for Ruby for machine learning. So, you know, very easy acronym here. Um, and that provides all the machine learning models and algorithms. It's, it's very much like scikit-learn for everyone who's ever uh, worked on Python, similar things. Um, so yeah, so that, that takes us a bit, that's a bit further to, to do some, some more interesting stuff with it actually. Right. So let's have a look at Numo first. All right. Let's do a bit of code here. Um, yeah, first of all, you know, as always, um, uh, and we do with students as well, just starting up IRB, um, then loading up the Numo library. Uh, and then if you want to do a few array operations, so for example, we can here, uh, start just a very random matrix uh, with two uh, rows, three columns. We have one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, then if we call shape on that, it gives us the, uh, the shape of the matrix. We can then query for either the, uh, the rows, like here. So we, we uh, set the first value to zero, the second value to true. So that gives us the first row, which is one, two, three. Uh, we can also look for the second column, for example, which is here three and six. So yeah, numbering starts with zero, uh, as, as it does in most cases in Ruby. Then we can just do simple arithmetic, arithmetic like uh, adding two to our matrix, which gives us the new matrix of three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, we can add the matrix to itself by doing X plus X. Uh, also, again, gives us the expected result. But we can also sum up, for example, uh, um, column, column wise, if we pass uh, zero to the function, which gives us uh, one plus four is five, two plus five is seven, and three plus six is nine. All right, so again, very much expected result. We can also do mean, um, and same again, we, uh, uh, here we pass one as arguments to do the mean by row instead of column. And that gives us the mean of the first row, which is two, mean of the second row is five, right? So quite easy and obvious stuff. Uh, but the interesting thing about uh, this is that it has a very efficient implementation, right? So if you have uh, a lot of dimensions in your, um, in your data, it will, it will be uh, quite efficient and fast uh, to do some, some pre-processing there. Yeah, then again, we can also reshape our matrix so we can switch rows and columns quite easily with just one function call. That's gonna be also very fast for larger data. Um, and then, yeah, here you, you, you just see a bit of a more advanced example, but uh, still doing just very basic linear regression. So we could, uh, for example, load up the Rumale library. We can uh, start a new array. So in that case, we have uh, three rows with zero, one, one, zero, one, two, right? So those could be, for example, our weights for, um, for the features that we want to train a model on. Uh, and then we just, you know, create a very simple, uh, linear model with here. We have, uh, one as the Y intercept. We have two times the, the first, um, the first, uh, 
column actually here, uh, three times the second column. So this is the first and second feature. Um, and then we just create a new linear regression model using Rumala here. Uh, we set fit bias to true. We set maximum iterations to 10,000. So th those are the iterations that we train the model on. And then we, when we call fit, so this is called training the model, uh, we pass on the, our weights and our model. Um, and that gives us this very nice output here that maybe uh, looks a bit cryptic for people who have not done machine learning before, but it basically just you know creates all the parameters for the model, um, like uh, for example here the batch size, the the ratios, and and so on, like the random seeds and so on. So it's gonna it's gonna create a very basic linear model for you. It's go gonna try to fit uh, kind of function uh, based on your data, and then we can use this to predict. Uh, yeah, a very simple function here on, on our data X that we defined. So that gives us 439 as a prediction, right? So this is just, just a very short intro into uh, how quickly you can pull up a linear model. I'm going to get uh, into that in, uh, in a bit more detail uh, after a moment. But yeah, so just to show you how to use uh, those basic numeral um, library that's that's numo and and you know very much like um uh, numpy in python so yeah um yeah for storing the data it's also very easy so we're just writing the data to a file um as a dom so this would this would be just a, a binary write to to a random file that we call x here um, and also very easily we can load it up in the file again so we can just set the variable x uh, call Marshall load on it, and then create a bin read with the dump file. And then the interesting thing is, as I said, it's very compatible with NumPy as well. So we can just use uh, NPY save to save it to a, an, um, to a NumPy compatible file. So this is what you would do if you had just one model. But if you have more than one model um, in one file, you can also use the NPZ format. So you can just uh, write and load in the exact same way with the load mpz function to uh, an mpz file so you can you can save a lot of data in the numpy format and then load it up and use it in python as well so so usually uh what i personally do uh, a lot is to do some very quick stuff in in ruby but then if you if you go into the, uh, some more advanced stuff and you want it compatible to python code as well just save it to mpz or npy uh, load it up there and then use it in python as well so you can you can do that back and forth uh, however you like yeah so then the the first a bit more interesting library maybe is uh, the ru that's uh, that's short for data analytics in ruby so you can you may, maybe you see a pattern there in naming uh, that we have for those uh, ruby libraries uh, however, you know, as I said, this is very uh, similar to pandas. So you can load up all the stuff in uh, data frames, right? So once you've again uh, fired up IRB, loaded the the root library there, you could just uh, create a new data frame and store it in an object like here. So we have this data frame with uh, the name of starships, uh, having here the USS Enterprise, the USS Voyager and the uh, USS defiance. So, uh, so we've basically defined that we want us, we want uh, kind of a data frame or, or, um, or database table with the names of those ships. Then we also have a registry number uh, for each of the ships as well. Um, and then well, what we also want to do is we want to know how much crew each of the ships have as well. Um, and this will be the basis for our exploration on uh, what can be done with this data, right? So for example, we could say, we only want to see the first two columns, name and registry. Uh, so a data frame just gives us this. Or we could say, we just want to see the first entry uh, in our table. Uh, we could also want to see just the last one. So this is here, the enterprise and the defiance. Uh, or we could just filter out by a uh, number of rows. So we want to see row one to two, 
which gives us the, the Voyager and the Defiant. And also, if we, um, if we have a look at the output here a bit um, more, you're going to see that, that it also tells us which type of object we're getting back and the dimensions of the object, right? So, for example, the call to ships first is going to give us a data frame uh, one times three, right? Because we have just one row and three columns. Uh, but also the uh, ship's row function is going to give us a data frame of dimensions two times three. So we have two rows and three columns. But you always kind of see the dimensions of your data that's uh, going to be selected as well as you do that. Yeah, then uh, maybe a bit more sophisticated is if we go into uh, filtering, sorting, and grouping, right? Because, because we can do actually a lot of things if we're looking for specifics of ships. Uh, like in this example, we're looking at ships that have crew more than 500. So this is going to give us the Enterprise because it has 750. We could also look for ships with a specific name by calling the where uh, method on the ships object. Uh, so we, we say uh, ships where ships name equals USS Voyager. We get a data frame one times three. Again, uh, with the Voyager, the registry of the Voyager, and the crew size. Um, we could also take, uh, so we could also actually have, um, or yeah, look into um, a list of strings or an array of strings and try to, to see if one of those would fit our query. So in that case, we say we're looking into ships where the name is in defined and, and Ajax. Right, so one of these at least, um, and it gives us back the defiant because that's the one that's in our data frame. We can also uh, negate our query, uh, like in the next example. So we can say ships where it's not, uh, so the, the name does not equal USS Enterprise, right, with the exclamation mark here. Um, again, gives us data frame uh, two times three with the voyage and defiant in it. Uh, then we can also say uh, we can also combine it with an with a logical or. So we could say either the name is USS Voyager or the crew is more than 500. So that gives us a two times three data frame with the Enterprise and the Voyager. We can also sort by uh, by crew, for example, in ascending or the false. So that's going to be descending, um, and we get here first the Enterprise with crew of 750 then the Voyager with crew of 150, and then the Defiant with crew of 50. Um, and then also what we can do as well is uh, we could create just a completely new uh, data frame. Uh, if we want to have a look at a ship's, ship's uh, captains, for example, or uh, crew members, for example, right? So we could have a data frame here with uh, names of crew like Spock, Kirk, Uhura. Uh, we have their planets of origin being Vulcan and two times Ur. Um, and then we could just group by the planets, for example, right? So that would give us the number of crew that, or, uh, that have a specific planet of origin. So we have two people from Ur, one people from, from Vulcan in a two times one array. Um, yeah, so if we want to try to combine those data frames, right? So let's say we want to add more ships to um, our data frame of ships that we already have. We could create a completely new one by adding again uh, a few more ships with a specific name, registry, and crew number. So let's try uh, adding the USS Yamaguchi here uh, and the USS Prokofiev that uh, again have their very own uh, registries um, and uh, also size of crew. So this is gonna be now an array that has the same format as the one that we already have about our ships. So uh, we should have very, very little trouble in uh, combining this with our already existing data frame. Right, so what we do is we call uh, concat on, uh, on our ships object and uh, pass more ships as an argument, which gives us a, a nice data frame with overview here with the two new ships that we just added uh, and their registry numbers and crew and so on. 
so then we could also decide to extend the data frame with uh, more data. So let's say now we know uh, also the names of captains of the ships. So we have here Kirk, uh, Janeway, Archer, Cisco, and uh, Zulu um, as our captains. Please forgive me uh, the, the inaccuracy for all the trackies out here, uh, but you know, just coming up with a few examples uh, for us. So uh, we have also an affiliation here. So all of them are obviously Starfleet. So we're adding this here as, as well as a new column. Um, and then what we can do with this uh, new data frame is, um, is adding it to ships, right? So we call the merge method on our ships object. Uh, then we have captains. That, so that's the new data frame to just create it to, um, to add to that. Um, and what happens is, so we get a data frame that's five times five, right? So we have five uh, int entries or five rows here with five columns. And as you can see he, uh, here, we have added uh, this new captain uh, information or you know, column, as well as the affiliation to the original data frame. Um, yeah, so again, it's very easy to read and write too, right? So if you just wanna save this, uh, this data frame to a CSV file, we just call the write CSV uh, method on the object and define the name of the file. Also very easy to read from that. So just uh, call the uh, class method from CSV on the data frame uh, class, uh, define the, the file name as well again, and then read it in. So this is, this is this happening a lot of times if you do some manipulations on your data frame and you wanna save the, the filtering and grouping and so on uh, to a new file um, after you know kind of very quick data analysis. Yeah, and then maybe also uh, a bit of a more interesting part is if you want to plot all this. So here uh, we could just call uh, the the plot method on our on our data frame object, um, and then just define the type of our of our plot. So in this case, the bar plot, uh, the name of X and Y, which is here uh, the name of the ship and the crew. Um, and then we we get a plot object and a diagram object from this, which means that we have an object that represents each plot that's on our uh, diagram that we, that we are kind of painting here, uh, and the diagram object that rep represents the whole uh, picture as well. Okay, so in, uh, in that case, we would define uh, plot X uh, or the X label of the plot to be name, the Y label to be crew, and then the color of our diagram uh, here with, uh, with some kind of pastel tone. I'm not sure what pastel one exactly is, but yeah, you can just try it out and see. Um, yeah, so at, the, um, at this point, I just wanna like to uh, switch here to, um, to a, a Ruby notebook that I've prepared. So just bear with me for a second uh, so I can do that. Okay, yeah, so hopefully you can see uh meaning of data frame obviously it's an object name is is this like a table with rows um is there a mathematical significance because obviously it looks a lot like a matrix as well um how deep do i need to go in the math to really get what a data frame is uh not at all so it's, it's actually just like like a, a table in sql or you know any uh database and it and it works very much that way so it's kind of an object that represents this uh database structure um and you know it makes it a bit easier to to just filter um yeah specific features or or uh values so so in machine learning what we're actually interested in so those columns in the data frame would represent features, right? So this is what we use to train a model. And the rows of, uh, of it uh, represent data points. So every row is kind of an example that we can use for, uh, for training a model uh, that then kind of learns what to expect. Um, and then for you know, unseen data, you would just uh, provide a few of the rows and then have, have a target feature to, uh, to predict for you uh, what's actually expected based on the model that you trained, right? Okay. So I'm, I'm gonna get a bit more into that uh, 
uh, in a second. But you know, it's just kind of kind of a um, um, object structure or data structure that that helps you to to deal with machine learning projects as they are also in literature and you know uh, have kind of a common vocabulary for that as well. Perfect. But Thank you. So yeah, this is just new to me, and I appreciate the. Quick but primer. mathematically, it doesn't have any significance, really, right? Because you know, you, you, you'd actually be working with uh, the arrays uh, or or matrices that result from the data uh, by a numo mathematically, right? So, so there's data frame itself is not really, uh, you know, of concern in, in that that way. Thank you. No problem. Um, yeah. So I hope you can see my little notebook here now. Um, so what I, what I would like to show you here, just some, uh, some types of plots that you can do as well. So we're just loading up the Roo here, uh, which means we're doing very light work. Um, and the distribution library here is just to, uh, to create a standard normal distribution, as you will see later on. So nothing really too complicated here. So what we're going to do is uh, the first one I want to show you is just a random scatter plot, right? So this is the, the easiest plot that really can be done um, and in that way i'm just gonna i'm just gonna generating 100 random numbers uh, to show there um, and then i'm just calling the uh, plot function or scatter data frame uh, object with defining the type to be scatter or scatter plot uh, and a and b to be on uh, x and y axis All right so I'm just going to show you this now, as you can see here, we get a very randomly distributed uh, type of data set, right? So we have X values from 0 to 100. We have Y values from 0 to 1. Um, and the nice thing is, so this data doesn't mean much, and you, you will never fit a, a um, linear model that makes any sense here. But, uh, but it just shows you know, how easy it is to plot out data. And the scatter plot is usually what, what we start with. Um, in a lot of cases, and it's nice. It's kind of nice if you just, you know, here scroll over it, and you can see the exact values of specific data points. It's so a very easy data, uh, very easy scatter plot can already, you know, show uh, the distribution of your data and give you a bit of insight as a very first touch point here. So then, if you want to do uh, something a bit more interesting, uh, what I have here is ice cream sales in Dublin and Cork. A uh, very, uh, very uh, popular cities in Ireland, as you might know. Um, so we have here temperature. In that case, it's in degrees of Celsius. So you know it's not all that cold, um, as it might seem. And then we have sales numbers, as well in um, another column. And we have those two cities. So I'm just multiplying that with five to you know uh, save some work. And then we have stuff uh, as well. So we have 20 people working in Dublin, 15 people in Cork, also just multiplied by five to give us our data frame here. Uh, so if I run this, you're gonna see this nice table structure that shows us an overview uh, of the data we're looking at. And then again, I'm gonna do just a very simple scatter plot here. So we have here, again, type scatter, uh, X is temperature, Y is sales. Uh, and then I, I'm gonna get those two objects, plot and diagram that show me this one plot that we have here and the diagram is is the whole thing right so you could actually have more than one plot on one diagram um, as we will see also in an example later on uh, then i'm labeling x with temperature y with sales i have a range uh, for y from 100 to 600 a range on x from 10 to 40 so you can set this manually uh, as you as you like um, then I'm using tooltips, uh, so even you can uh, you can even decide what to use on tooltips. Like here we have city and staff, which are different from from the x and y axis, uh, as you can see here. Then again, defining a col color um, for our diagram and filling the color by city and also shape by city. So as you will see is. Uh, here is we're gonna get a different shape and color for the two cities. So we have here um, the the uh, blue triangle for Cork. We have the red circle for Dublin, right? And you can see here as well our little trend here. 
that we have is that when temperature rises, also sales are going to rise, which makes a bit of sense if we think about the ice cream business, right? Um, but again, shows you how easy it is actually to pull up a bit of data to, um, to make it uh, kind of visually appealing as well. Um, and to easily see differences in trends for, uh, for different data sets too. Um, then as the, the next example is uh, our age bar plot, right? So we're going to have uh, bars in this one. We have uh, five people and their ages here. So let's say we have Alfie, George, Rudolph, Sean, and Chris. Uh, they have all different ages, as you can see here. We can also, we can also order by... Uh, each of those things. So in that case, we go name before age. Um, and then we can also sort our data frame um, as well by age, for example, in that case, right? So we can again see a nice table here. Um, and then we're going to plot, in this case, a bar chart. So that's a new one uh, here. Again, we label X and Y. We define the range. So that's everything that you've already seen. Right, then we got this nice little overview, right? So we have different colors for all the bars. We can hover over the bars with our mouse and show the, the uh, actual value of them. So we can see that Alf Alfie is the oldest person here and Sean is the youngest one, right? So all quite nice and easy so far, right? Um, then another one is here, uh, letter frequent frequency in a bar chart. So we have just randomly assigned frequencies for the letters A, C, G, and T, um, saved them in data frame, and then uh, created a bar chart that shows this frequency. So the, um, the kind of difference here is that we have, uh, uh, that we actually have uh, the uh, a frequency-based diagram rather than uh, diagram that's based on uh, two values as before. Um, another maybe interesting one is if we look at uh, distributions, right? So uh, each of you who has, who has done a statistics course is probably aware of uh, kind of basic statistics like uh, mean, uh, deviance, variation, stuff like that, right? So, so in that case, we have, again, just... Uh, so we're using now this distribution library that I mentioned before to give us a standard normal distribution, um, which is going to be visualized as, um, as um, a, a box plot here, as you can see. So we have just manipulated a bit the, uh, the mean um, and, um, and the um, deviation. So as you can see here, we're gonna get a, a few of those box plots. So this line in the middle is gonna show you the, the mean Right, then we have the first quartile and the third quartile that shows you 50% of values falling in this box. So hence the name of box plots. And then you have the line that goes uh, over and below uh, this little box that shows, that shows you the rest of the 50%. And then the dots um, at the bottom and top, they show you outliers, right? So you can see here, the first one is just the standard normal. So we have just this uh, mean that's at zero. We have the de uh, deviation that's, uh, that, yeah, just looks like a normal distribution. And then the first one is the one that we changed a bit. So we uh, divided by 0.8 and subtracted two to get it a bit lower, right? So we can see here that the mean is significantly lower. The box is bigger. So we have changed the, uh, the uh, deviation as well. And then for the other two, again, so we changed, so we uh, increased a bit the mean, we changed the deviation for both for the first one, a bit uh, less than for the second one. But you can see that, you know, we're playing around with distributions and this type of plot is going to show you how uh, differently distributed data is uh, compares to, to each other basically. So you can break it down to uh, a standard distribution every time and then compare those type of data to see uh, how your mean compares and how your uh, variance and deviation compares as well. So that's done a lot of times as well as very uh, basic and first exploration in data. Um, and as you can see here, can be done very efficiently with Ruby too. 
So then going back to temperature in Ireland, right? We have here a data set of several days, several temperatures measured in Dublin. Uh, we can again go back to, uh, to create a line uh, plot here, right? So we're looking at the day and temperature. We have again labels, we have a legend here as well. So if I just run this, you're gonna see um, our nice legend here. You, you can see how the temperature changes for each of the weekdays in Dublin. So one thing about Ireland is that you can have all four seasons in just one day. So for any of you who has ever been to Ireland, they will probably be able to confirm this, but you know, we can have a lot of, a lot of rain, but it can be very short and there can be a lot of sun as well and all in the same day. So, you know, it's, it's very wild. Sometimes if you're looking, if you're going to the beach or looking for a, for a nice hike or something, it's always very adventurous. Um, yeah, then a histogram can be done as well very easily. So here again, just a random, uh, random data shown in, uh, shown with the frequency here, different bins. So you can define, you know, so this is usually done for categorical data that you try to bin and try to visualize in a histogram uh, so that you can compare uh, or, you know, find any trend that might be there. The time series also, for example, uh, very interesting. Um, and then here is an example of a scatter plot that has more than one, um, more than one uh, plot in it, right? So we can, here we uh, you, uh, actually have a temperature for Dublin, Cork, and, Go uh, and Galway, right? Um, we have a scatter plot. So we have X1 uh, and Y1 showing Dublin, X2 and Y2 showing Cork temperature, uh, X3 and Y3 showing uh, Galway temperature. And then we can see here the plot object is going to be, um, is going to be the whole plot and the diagrams object is going to show you, show us every diagram for uh, that shows on the plot so uh we could assign diagram zero to be dublin uh, diagrams one to be cork diagrams two to be go away right then we can set the title and color of it um for each of those uh, we can again show a legend define the ranges and label the axis so if i run this we're gonna see we have different colorings for each of the different cities. We can again hover over it to see the values and we can see again that there is a bit of a trend, but for example, Dublin is a bit warmer than the other two which are on the, on the West Coast. So they have a bit of a rougher uh, climate there, uh, but it's easy to you know kind of visualize different types of data on one graph uh, and give you a bit of, uh, yeah, distinction in color and, and shape and so on. Yeah, so the, and the last example that I have here is about uh, burger data, right? So we have here a bit of fitting a model. So this is actually a very basic uh, linear regression that's done by hand here. Um, so we have here different types of burgers, as you can see. We have, uh, we're looking uh, for fat and calories in each of those. Um, and then also we're ordering by name, fat and calories in our graph, or actually data frame first. Right, so you can see here the data frame. Um, and then, so yeah, so don't pay much attention into this. So this is just the uh, linear regression formula done by hand that, uh, that shows you basically the slope and y-intercept of our model. So we're calculating this by hand here. Um, and then we're just mapping this to um, our y-coordinates of our burger data frame. Uh, and then all we do is we uh, create here uh, first a scatter plot and then a line plot to um, to show us the the fat versus calories and the fat versus y coordinates, um, as we will see in our example here. So um, yeah, so our diagram zero is the scatter plot. Diagram one is going to be the regression line. Um, so you can see here those. Um, those uh, blue points here are going to be different burgers like the fish fillet here or the, the crispy chicken here and then we have uh, this regression line that predicts based on the fat and calories of our burger um, which uh, where they will actually end up right so 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 what you could do is if you introduce a new burger and you say you know you you know what what's the uh, how much fat it has 
but you don't know the calories, it's gonna, our model can predict that for you and, and find a fit on the line. Yeah, so hopefully it gives you a bit of an intro into how, you, uh, how plots can be done here. Uh, so let me just switch back to the presentation to show you a bit more uh, of machine learning. Um, because so we have still one uh, library to go. So that's the Rumale one. And as I said, this is the maybe a bit more interesting one because that gives you kind of the, um, the machine learning stuff that usually people expect if they talk about data analytics and data science. Right, so um, we're just gonna load it up again in IRB. Um, and then what we're gonna do here is we're going to create a model, uh, but first we're loading some data. Um, and yeah, a few things to mention here. So this, this file that I'm loading here, it's called pen digits. So this is about uh, digits written in handwriting with a pen, right? So those are images of digits that people have written by hand. It's also sometimes called the uh, hello world for uh, deep learning, right? Because this is the example, uh, the deep learning example that people always start with when they do any kind of neural networks. Um, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm extracting the training uh, X and Y. So the X always in uh, machine learning is are our features, right? So those, those, this is the info that we put into the model to train it and to uh, kind of define how the shape of the model is gonna predict uh, further things for us. And the Y is the so-called target feature. So this is what we're actually trying to predict, right? So by showing the X and Y together to a model and training it, we're gonna just trying to, we're just trying to teach the model how to find Y given X basically. Right, so in this case, we're gonna get a, a defloat pneumo matrix with the shape of 7,490. Uh, 7, uh, four times 16, right? So we have 16 features um, and 7,000, almost 7,500 uh, data points. Um, and then we're using a kernel approximation uh, transformer, so an RBF model, to uh, transform this into binary features so we can train the model afterwards. Um, and then we're fitting this model to the transformer, right? So we're using the training set X here to uh, basically fit transform the model. So we're trying to teach the model how to do this. Then we create a linear model uh, classifier. So this is the support vector machine, which works very similarly to uh, linear regression. So basically again, predicts based on a line, but with a border. So there's a bit of more complexity in there uh, when, deci when deciding how to classify specific data. Um, and then we again fit transform with the transform data set and the uh, train Y, so the, the labels that we have for our, uh, for our target, uh, target uh, features. Uh, and what we get here is, uh, again, for this shape, so we get those 10 digits that are written by hand, and we get weights for those, uh, for those um, digits that are based on the model that we trained. And this helps us basically to predict um, how, to, uh, how to classify an, an unseen image of a digit being uh, some, some digits from zero to nine. Right, so what we're doing here is we run this uh, um, and then we get in kind of a probability of how likely uh, a digit is going, going to be zero or one or two uh, and so on. So once we've done this, so this training usually takes up most of the time if you're doing any type of data science, right? So, and given, given that training is the computationally most intensive task here, uh, what usually is done is you train a model once, then you save it to a file, and whenever you need it again, you just load up the file and then try to classify uh, new data based on the model that you already trained. Right, so therefore, uh, what we're doing here is we uh, save the transformer, so the transform data that we have, and we uh, save the classifier as well uh, to several to two files, uh, so that we can later on load it up and try to predict new stuff. Okay, so this is basically uh, exactly what we're going to do next here. Right, so we again, uh, let's say we we'll, we have a another data set where we know about the uh, the features and the target feature. So we know 
uh, what kind of data predicts what kind of output. Uh, so we're loading up this new data set. And now that we have trained the model already with, uh, with data that we used for training, now we can use this test data to test how well our model actually performs. Right? So this is something that our model is not aware of yet. So we're just using the, uh, these features and don't show the uh, target feature to the model yet, but we're then uh, going to compare the output of the model to the actual uh, expected output that we have in this file. Right? So we load the transformer again from the file that we saved it to. We load the classifier as well uh, to, to our classifier object here too. So now that we have this, what we can do is we can use this uh, test data to, uh, yeah, to actually test how well our model is going to perform, right? So we uh, we transform again this uh, this data, this uh, test data, to the transformed object. So we again get the shape. Uh, so in, in that case, for example, we have uh, about three and a half thousand data points. Um, and then we're measuring the accuracy, right? So here uh, we're calling the classifier object and use the score method to compare actually the transformed data set uh, to, the, uh, to the test set that we have. So the, the output of the test set actually that we have, right? So what we're doing here is we use the model with the new test data and use it to predict the new stuff and then compare it to the test Y that we actually know that that is the expected output. And what we get here is an accuracy of 98.5%, right? So, so you can see with this kind of very simple model, um, we're already getting quite good results uh, in predicting um, handwritten digits here based on, on the pictures that we have. So this is one thing that we can do. If you wanna be a bit more um, exact about measuring, we can, we can do so-called cross-validation. Right, so cross-validation means we're using uh, several parts of the data set uh, and then switching those around to get um, and testing against each other to get a bit of a more precise uh, measure of how well our model performs. Right, so in our case here, we are using uh, logistic regression to do that. We are using a, a accuracy uh, as evaluation metrics metric, uh, we're using a um, stratified k-fold, right? So this is, this is this kind of splitting of the data set with five splits. So we are splitting in five parts and then comparing, uh, so using each of the five parts to, te uh, to train and compare to the rest um, as a test result. So once we have called this, we get our model. So the, the next line would give us kind of the, uh, the let's say, parameters of the model. Um, and then we run the cross-validation uh, on it. So we're using our, uh, our estimator, splitter, and evaluator that we defined before. Uh, run the cross-validation here, and we get five different uh, metrics or metric results here, basically, on our accuracy. Uh, so then all we have to do is just, uh, just basically find the average of those. Uh, as you can see, those are a bit lower than we had before with with our support vector machine model, but now we use just sim uh, a simpler model, which is logistic regression, right? So we can expect a bit uh, less accuracy here, and then we uh, taking the mean out of these uh, these five uh, outcomes that we have to display uh, what kind of accuracy we're going to have for this model. Uh, and that gives us 95.4%. So as you can see, it's, it's a bit uh, lower than before because we used a simpler model, but this is going to give you uh, a much better estimate of the actual accuracy of, mo of the model. So you're going to know uh, how well your model actually performs with unseen data. Yeah, and I think the last part here uh, that I want to mention is pipelining, right? So all those steps that we've seen before can be done uh, with nice pipelines as well. So you can basically create um, a whole streamlined um, yeah, workflow basically for evaluating different types of models uh, on specific data, incorporating their uh, evaluation metrics and um, 
and also this kind of splitting of data sets to give you a, a better estimate. So here, for example, we are creating a kernel approximation model again. We're creating a linear model too. Uh, here in this case, again, logistic regression. So uh, again, quite a simple model. And we're using all this in a pipeline so that we can run this uh, very efficiently and also compare to, uh, to different kinds of models too. So for example, here we can use this pipeline uh, for our logistic regression model based on the, uh, the, the kernel approximation. Um, we again just define the steps uh, here. For example, we define the transformer, the classifier um, for the pipeline. And then we can uh, again define our K fold. So, for example, here the Rumali model selection uh, class or module actually provides the stratified K fold class that we can create with again a predefined number of splits. Uh, we can define how it should be shuffled around um, and the, the random uh, the random seed as well. So there's usually uh, always one. Um, so again, so then if we uh, just run this, so we have here, for example, a model selection um, by defining cross-validation. Yeah, and as you can see here, we are actually defining the pipeline to be the estimator for the new model, the KF to be the splitter. Um, and then we can uh, create a report by calling the perform methods on our cross-validation object uh, with X train and Y train. We're gonna get those five metrics uh, as before. And then just, uh, so just again, we can use the average of those to find to find a better estimate, we can then uh, yeah use this basically to to create mean accuracy. This is divided by five in that case, um, and we get uh, ninety nine point five six percent of accuracy. As you can see here, so you're just converting this into a percentage output to show you uh, yeah ninety nine point six percent here. Yeah, so so this is basically what you can do. As you can see, is it it can be quite complex as well, um, and you know there's a lot of stuff that can be done. So those are just the very basic things, uh, more or less. If you're interested in other libraries too, so there's actually a library for everything in Ruby too. Most of those are quite good. Um, I haven't tried all of them to be honest myself, but I have here at least a list of of the libraries for the most important tasks that we can do. So. Visualization can also be done with Vega, uh, so especially if you need a bit of uh, something more sophisticated than uh, we've seen with, with the basic plotting before. Then we have Rover as an alternative for data frames if you don't like the Roo. Uh, but I think most people use the Roo uh, to, to do that because it's, I think it's more similar to Pandas. Even though personally, I've actually, uh, I, I think that, that the Roo is more intuitive so you know, if you if you've never worked with data frames before, I think the room might be easier to learn than than pandas itself. Um, then, if you want to do gradient boosting, so if you want to uh, to use an algorithm to find the the optimum fit for a specific model, there's XGBoost, LightGBM as libraries to do those. Then we have deep learning. So in deep learning in Python, you've probably heard uh, about TensorFlow. So that this is the the high end one that that Google developed, but there's also uh, PyTorch, for example, which is actually quite good, uh, and a lot of people are switching from TensorFlow to to PyTorch because it's uh, easier to to customize. Um, and there is a Ruby uh, version of of, of PyTorch as well that's called Torch.rb. Um, then we have recommendation models done with Disco. I haven't tried this one myself, but feel free to do so and let me know. Uh, we have factorization with XLearn. So this is, uh, for example, if you're trying to do dimensional reduction or you know, work with a lot with the, the NUMA part and the matrices and multi-array data and stuff like that, then we have informers for NLP. 
Um, so NLP is actually uh, one, if you heard about NLTK, so that's the Python library for NLP that most people use. I think Informus is quite good as well, uh, especially if you're maybe not doing, you know, uh, top of the edge research, but just kind of commercial, commercial uh, NLP or, you know, L NLP on easier tasks that are more controllable. So I, I always recommend to try out the Ruby libraries too, but if you, you know, kind of find errors there or are not very satisfied, you can always go back uh, to Python to do that. Then we have fast text for text classification um, and tokenization. So those are actually both NLP tasks. Um, we have Tomoto for topic modeling. So this is the kind of thing where you kind of trying to classify documents according to a specific uh, topics that are mentioned in them. We have uh, forecasting. So Profit is the is the Facebook library for forecasting. So most people who, who work on time series are using this, uh, but there's also a Ruby version uh, here too. Uh, and reinforcement learning. So this is kind of the uh, so one of the one of the very fancy and you know trendy topics that people use in research. Uh, so we have Vaupol and Wobbit here. I haven't used any of those myself again, but uh, yeah, if you're interested, have a look and let me know. So yeah, as so as you can see, you know, there's a lot of libraries um, that can be used. So uh, yeah, happy to talk about anything that anyone's interested into diving deeper. But yeah, that's basically what I wanted to show you today. So thanks a lot for uh, listening. And yeah, I hope to keep in touch with uh, at least a few of you. But yeah, as long as this uh, meetup is, is going to be still virtual, I'm very happy to join and uh, see how you're getting on. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I mean, so, I mean, I feel like you just opened the window on an area of work that some of us only tangentially get to see. And it's just really fascinating to see not only code examples. Uh, I, I do believe this is the first time I've ever seen Jupyter notebooks with Ruby code. I don't know if you have to like do any tricks to get it to recognize that you can do Ruby or, or what, but um, that was really neat to see. Um, the number of times that I have used Pry and like generated an image and saved it off to a temp file and had to like open it through, you know, <laughs> somehow that's pretty neat to see. Um, um but uh i guess open the floor to questions uh about uh what was shown uh any anything you'd like to ask do you use any of this in production <laughs> well, well i'm a lecturer so you know <laughs> i'm not really uh working for industry uh there are a few industry projects actually that that we do collaborate with and that do use ruby uh, but you know, I can't really tell you how much of it is really used in production too. So, so you know, my advice in terms of if you're thinking of using any of those in production is to just try it out on a small scale and then try to scale it up and see how it works. But, um, but so, so actually, this is one of those those things that why uh, a lot of people run to Python because there's there's a lot of more trust into it, you know. So, you know, given that that a lot of community support and resources and, you know, just all this uh, publicity and, and people working on, on, on Python code, um, I think there's just a lot more trust. So, you know, kind of people would go to Python if they, they want something reliable. But I think you can still get uh, quite a long way with Ruby. And, you know, so personally, Unfortunately, I'm I'm not an industry person, so I can't really tell you uh, how well this would work on a huge scale uh, and in production. But you know, for for my purposes, it was it was more than uh, more than good enough. So it's definitely worth a try. But it, I guess it depends a lot on the project and on the scale and, and everything. So let me ask kind of a follow up question: um, If if someone didn't have a full 
explorational data, but you needed to, I don't know, do some of this background processing on like a Rails app on like a server, would it make yeah. sense potentially to to pull in some of these libraries rather than trying to just code up some whatever manipulation, even if it's just purely behind the scenes yeah. model oh, yeah, usage? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's that's the best use case for it. So, I mean, actually, the the, the thought I'm, I, I was having most of the time is, you know, if you use Rails, you don't want to switch to to, uh, to Python for just kind of very basic things and where you just need a bit of machine learning or a bit of data analytics. So, uh, so there's a lot of lot of uh, good reasons to to do that on Ruby, and some of the stuff is is actually really good as far as I can tell. I mean, again, I'm just a lecturer, but <laughs> but uh, and you know, so just comparing it to 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 Python on on a on a level that that is kind of reachable for for normal people, um, I think it's it's really good and it's definitely overlooked by many. But uh, but definitely work uh, worth a try, especially for people who who uh, use Rails and and want to have it there. Anyone else? Don't be shy. I mean, as a as a lecturer, it seems like you uh, probably deal with students who are in this field. Uh, past the introductory phase, um, you mentioned uh, this would be normal for kids who have taken physics or young students who've taken physics uh, to start to know this uh, linguistics or the language, right? Uh, yeah. To communicate it. Um, for those of us who have not taken physics since they were 17 and are, and are in their mid 30s, uh, what, like, where do we start, right? Like, these are great. They're, they're great libraries. They're great. Um, packages for us to be able to use and start to do some basic modeling for our businesses. But where do we start to, to be able to even use these? Like what's a, what's a good bridge uh, between what we do now and how to use these? Yeah, so, so my advice basically to people who, who want to get a bit into it is always to, to just find very simple tasks that can be, that can be solved with, uh, with data analytics. So if you look at the root, for example, right, it's really easy to pull in a CSV file, like a, an, an Excel or, uh, or, or Google spreadsheet or whatever. And then if you're trying to kind of, you know, work with this data, like kind of filter and, and try to find this interesting thing in that, um, it's kind of very easy to, to pull this in, to try out some stuff. And then, and then, you know, you just kind of naturally progress from, from one level to the next. And then you might think, okay, it's nice to to have all these insights, but actually, I would also like to know what happens if I pull in new data. So, what can I expect uh, from those? Uh, and you know, how could I maybe forecast a bit uh, on one of the variables or features that I use there? So, so you would kind of you know, if you're if you're this kind of person that you know tries to autom automate uh, actually kind of day to day tasks uh, in their daily job. And, and I think a lot of coders do that, and a lot of people who are, you know, software engineers uh, do that. So, so it kind of is a step step by step process to to get you this bit and bit further. And then you know, but but I think the the essence of it is just to start very simple. And you know, instead of just you know, instead of uh, kind of making uh, spreadsheet formulas and try to filter our data, just pull it into a data frame and and, and try you know the rule on it. And see if, if that, you know, gives you better results or or you know feels more natural to you. So uh, so I, I would just start with very very simple tasks and and it it would get you uh, the, the step further naturally. I think that that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I've been reading into like first principle thinking, yeah, and the idea of like start with the most basic problem that you're trying to solve and then go from there, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, Slightly unrelated question. What was the presentation software you use right there? Like Markdown presentation? Yeah, I get this every time. <laughs> so, so this is actually present. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a Python package that translates Markdown to a, con uh, to a terminal uh, slide 
um, presentation. It's really nice, actually, if you want to show code. And so th and that has a, a plugin that's called Codio. So you can basically, uh, so you have a YAML file that, that defines what kind of lines of code you want to display and then uh, then reads that in and then shows it like uh, typing in the code. So it's kind of, you know, really nice if you want to, um, to show a bit of coding inside of a presentation. That's awesome. Thanks. I think you've literally given us all so much information to look up. Yes. Find that we're like, we are all of our brains are like conceptually trying to smash <laughs> in what you just said into our own framework and our own frame. Right. And, and trying to discover like what this is and how we can use it. Like that was the silence is deafening. And I don't think it's that people like, we just don't know what questions to ask. Yeah, yeah. I agree with that. My mouth has been hanging open. Most of this, I'm just it's wild. This is incredible. It's incredible. So let's say yeah, you load up a data frame um, with some data, and are you going to, ch well, not just a data frame. So, so you load up a model, and now it's time to save the model so that you can use it again later. Is it going to be saved into a, an efficient binary format? Are you dumping it to something like a serialized CSV? Or are you dumping it in a database? Or does that really just depend upon what you're doing with it? Um, yeah, so there are two options actually. So if it's just a data frame, um, and you're just kind of saving the text data, mm -hmm. it's going to be a CSV format, but if it's already a trained model, so that can be huge. Um, and this is then going to be a, a binary file. That's, that's pretty efficient actually. Right. So as I, as I, uh, mentioned, it's, uh, compatible with NumPy as well. Right. Okay. So, so all those, uh, multi-dimensional matrices and um, and arrays that you can that you can use the same uh, and generating the model that's going to be saved as a, as a binary file and that's and that's going to be a uh, very efficient format but but usually the data that you're actually dealing with that's 99 percent of the time just csv data and that's how it's going to be read in and saved but okay. you know there's, there's nothing much you can do about it and from a pragmatic standpoint, that would just be like any other file on disk or file in an S3 or equivalent yeah. cloud bucket of some sort. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So it's not a surprise that I'm a big Ruby fan, but when it comes to machine learning and the deep learning stuff that the communities have created, why would we consider using a Ruby? deep learning utility opposed to what's already been the industry standard um well so for deep learning i agree you know there's no really compelling argument to to tell you that you absolutely have to use ruby but um but it, again it depends a lot on what you plan to do so if if you if your task is tensorflow you just got to use tensorflow right and that's python but but if it is something that uh, yeah that that is kind of a very general uh, neural network problem for example then you could use uh, torch rb as well because that's just the ruby implementation of torch and then it just falls down to uh, language efficiency so it just falls down to a comparison between python and ruby and what's more efficient and what's what's better to use for the task at hand or you know what's more natural for you as a coder. Um, so you know if you're going to use PyTorch, there's no reason not to use Torch or uh, RB. But if you if you have to use Google libraries for any reason, then you're going to end up with TensorFlow anyway, right? So so you know especially deep learning. Deep learning is really uh, kind of complex and and really depends on the exact problem at hand. So if you're going to use a simple LSTM, or if you're going to use convolutional neural networks, so, you know, it always depends on actually what are you trying to achieve uh, and what are your kind of environmental variables you're dealing with. Um, 
but so even in Python, right? So in Python, there is no single answer to that. There are at least three major neural network libraries that you can use there. And you can never tell which one unless you have absolutely defined your uh, your whole problem. Uh, but again, we have we have PyTorch that that's translated so that works in Ruby code as well. And if you know you're going to use that, it doesn't really matter which language. So it's, it's just up to you then. This is amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you.